And what's actually really cool is if you have somebody with a frostbitten toe that's several months out and it's completely auto amputated, you can actually take that toe and you can send it to the sourdough saloon in Dawson City, Canada, where they have what's called a sour toe cocktail, where they've got a bucket of frostbitten toes that they'll put in a glass of whiskey and you do the shot of whiskey and you kiss the toe. So there's something you can do with your toe after you've lost it. Welcome back to the PFC podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC podcast. This is Dennis. I'm t- here today with Paul and uh, Ian. Um, Ian, uh, for those who don't remember our last podcast, could you do a quick introduction? Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm Ian Wedmore, an emergency physician, uh, just retired from the military, uh, still work at Madigan clinically. Uh, I have an extensive background in wilderness medicine. I was with uh, U.S. SOCOM for uh, 19 years. Uh, started up the bonus, the U.S. Army's Austrian Wilderness Medicine Fellowship, which I turned over when I retired, and still heavily involved in wilderness medicine, prolonged field care, and uh, still working clinically in emergency medicine. That's quite a bit of a background, I guess. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, you definitely know what you're talking about. So um, today we're going to talk about uh, cold weather injuries. Um, so Ian, why don't you uh, head it off? Okay, yeah, the, what I was going to talk about today was uh, frostbite and non-freezing cold injury, or what's commonly known as trench foot. Uh, these are obviously injuries that have had huge military consequences in the past. I mean, just for some of the numbers, you know, Napoleon in 1812 invaded Russia with 250,000 effective troops, came back with 350 effective out of that 250,000. A lot of that was hypothermia, but a significant number of those were also frostbite and non-freezing cold injuries. So, during the the Russian-German conflict in World War II, just in November and December 1942, the Germans alone had to do 15,000 amputations for frostbite. The, the Italian invasion of Greece in 1940, in just one month, they had 13,000 cases of frostbite. And for the U.S., We've had uh, literally tens of thousands of frostbite and trench foot injuries when you combine World War I, World War II, and the Korean Wars. Uh, Fortunately, we haven't seen much of these injuries recently. Really, the last uh, conflict that had uh, amputations and any significant frostbite was really, uh, sorry, non-trench foot, non-freezing cold injury was uh, the Falklands conflict, which in review is almost uh, 40 years ago now. Uh, fortunately, with most of our conflicts now, we've been able to prevent uh, most of those. Now, where I see this coming in to prolonged field care would be those that are injured in cold environments and uh, unable to protect themselves. And then certainly if you have a crash or accident which strands you out in a cold environment or if you have to do an E&E unexpected in a uh, cold environment. And certainly one of the future areas that's being looked at within the military is the ability to handle cold weather combat, which we haven't done in a long, long time. Now, the the references that I think are useful for people to look at for these injuries, uh, first is obviously the joint trauma system, uh, frostbite and immersion, foot care, CPG. Then also there's two major civilian CPGs, which really have a lot more information on these injuries, and those are the Wilderness Medical Society's Frostbite Clinical Practice Guidelines and the State of Alaska Cold Injuries Guidelines. Uh, Those are all available uh, for free. Just Google WMS Frostbite Guidelines or Alaska Cold Injuries Guidelines and you'll be able to, to pull either of those up. I want to start off with some definitions uh, just so that everybody understands what we're talking about. Uh, there's uh, frostbite. Uh, frost nip, and then trench foot and non-freezing cold injury. Frostbite is what we talk about when we're actually talking about actual freezing of the tissue and injury or damage of the tissue, as opposed to frost nip, which some people will confuse with superficial frostbite. 
Frost nip is actually just ice forming on the outside of the tissues. So like if you're you're skiing and you see those little tiny white dots appear on somebody's face or the tip of their nose, those are actually ice crystals forming on the surface of the skin, but there's not actually any freezing of the tissue itself or within the tissue, as opposed to frostbite, which includes superficial frostbite, where you actually have freezing of that tissue itself. And then uh, non-freezing cold injury, or what we commonly call trench foot, an immersion foot is tissue that's been damaged by cold, but not actual freezing of the tissue over some prolonged period of time leading to the issue. Probably the, probably the first thing I should go over is uh, prevention because all of these, you can treat them, but prevention is the, the most important thing you can do. Uh, and there's a, a couple of basic guidelines. Number one is stay warm. You know, protect yourself from the environment. So stay protected from the wind, uh, have enough insulation. And people often ask, well, you know, where's the risk? Well, anytime it's uh, below free freezing or below freezing, you're at risk for frostbite. Uh, temperatures below 60 degrees, you're at risk of non-freezing cold injury or trench foot. But when we talk about frostbite, particularly once you start getting to temperatures of uh, 15 below or lower, you're really at extreme risk of frostbite. And that can be kind of a combination of actual temperature as well as wind chill. Now, again, wind chill is only going to affect tissue that's not covered by anything. So as long as you protect yourself from wind with some sort of covering, then you don't have to worry as much about wind chill. Yeah, that's something that I actually wanted to uh, to bring up. So in my experience, uh, you know, in the mountains of Colorado with Tent Group, you know, you go out there and you do some uh, some snowshoeing and you might do some uh, skiing, but you might also do some uh, ski joining where you're getting pulled behind a uh, uh, a snowmobile for a while. And so if the whole team is doing that, it makes a lot of sense for you guys to do some buddy checks and just to see what skin is exposed. Because if it's already at that negative 10, negative 15, and now you're adding on some miles per hour, um, it drops pretty uh, precipitously. And then you can't do anything about it because nobody's going to let go of the rope because their nose is cold until later on when now you have some of that, that stuff going on. Yeah, those are, those are great points. And that, you know, particularly that's a great example of where you really need to think about ahead of time. Are you going to be exposed uh, to wind and you got to protect it before that exposure happens? You know, again, if you're, if your skin is protected, then wind chill is really not an issue, you know, whether that's uh, goggles, uh, balaclava. Uh, and there's some additional factors that actually will help with that. Uh, it's been shown by a couple of different research projects now that if you have wind blowing over your face, exposed uh, exposed over the trigeminal area of the face, you'll actually cause vasoconstriction in the, the fingers and the toes. So just by protecting those areas from wind with uh, balaclava, something along those lines, you can actually reduce your risk of uh, frostbite because you reduce the, the basal constriction or constriction of the small blood vessels of your hand and your feet. And then you also bring up a really good point about buddy checks. You know, when, when you institute buddy checks for prevention of all these cold weather injuries, it has a significant decrease in the likelihood of them happening. And one of the things you're looking for in particular is that frost nip that we just mentioned before. You know, first you start seeing those little ice crystals forming somewhere, then that means you're in an ideal situation to set up subsequent frostbite. Now, so those are all great points. And then in addition to all that uh, protection, you know, the other things you want to do is you want to stay hydrated. You know, you got to perfuse the tissues. Um, you want to stay dry. Moisture increases your risk of both freezing and then certainly non-freezing cold injury trench foot really is a combination of cool temperatures and moisture together. You want to, again, make sure that you're perfusing your hands and your feet. You know, a lot of people, when they first start getting out into the cold, and, and I've honestly done this when I was younger, is you're like, oh, I got to put all this insulation. I got to put all these layers of socks on my boots before I go out so my feet don't get cold. And you end up actually just constricting the blood flow to those digits and increasing your risk, actually, of uh, frostbite. And then one thing that's been used in the past by militaries, we don't actually use it now, but is the use of 
protective emollients and oils. So rubbing oils over areas of the skin to decrease the risk of frostbite. And it turns out none of those help. There's a, a lot of uh, military, particularly foreign militaries that use those for a long time. So far, there's no research that shows that those help at all. So the, the really quick pathophysiology of frostbite, really not going to go into too much, uh, but just say there's a couple of phases. First one is the tissues freeze, and then they thaw, and then they freeze again. Because as the as you vasoconstrict enough, you decrease the temperature of tissues freeze, then you'll actually get some vasodilatation within the digits to allow some blood flow to go back in to try and save the tissues, but then that causes some ischemic injury, and then it gets cold again and refreezes. So you have a number of freeze-thaw phases. And this eventually leads to uh, some thrombosis, some vascular stasis, and then later that leads to some late ischemia. Really, the only important thing to know about all of this pathophysiology is that for the initial pathophysiology, there's some things that we can do with treatment that will affect the outcome of the tissue. Once you get to this late ischemic phase, uh, which is 24 or more hours after initial injury, there's really not much that we have that we can do to decrease what's going to happen to the tissues. Now, when we talk about frostbite, it's broken down into grading similar to what we use for burns. So uh, first degree versus uh, second degree versus third degree versus fourth degree, or more commonly now it's used as uh, superficial versus deep, just like we do with burns. Now, the trick with frostbite is that when you initially look at it out in the field, you can't tell what the appearance is going to be. They all look hard, pale, and numb. It's only when you've actually warmed it up that you can tell what the degree of frostbite is. So with first degree or superficial frostbite, once it's rewarmed, you've got some edema, a little bit of erythema. With second degree, you've got clear fluid-filled blisters. With third degree, you've actually got hemorrhagic blisters. And then fourth degree, you've got deep, dark, uh, brawny tissue distal to the hemorrhagic blisters. And when we break it down to superficial versus deep, first degree or edema and clear fluofil ves vesicles are superficial. Anything that's hemorrhagic and distal to hemorrhagic is deep because you get deep tissue involvement. Would you then also be able to classify that as reversible and irreversible? Uh, you, you can't classify it as reversible or irreversible because once you've, once you've warmed it up, that tells you the amount of the depth of the injury that you have. What you can do at that point, though, is you can get an idea of the ultimate prognosis. So the likelihood of losing digits and tissue, depending on where those levels of injury are. So the, the quick answer is, the more proximal that you have deep tissue injury, such as hemorrhagic blisters, the more likely you are to lose everything distal to that. And there's actually a, a grading system that is pretty simple to use. So it'll give you a pretty good idea what your likelihood is of losing digits distal to that. And that will have some considerations in figuring out what we need to do to treat somebody or where we need to get them um, for treatment. Now, with frostbite, uh, once you have somebody that uh, that has it, there's a number of decisions you're going to need to make as far as evacuation versus warming in place versus what do we do, particularly for in a prolonged field care situation. So, first thing to know is the gold standard for treatment of frostbite is rapid rewarming in warm water. That's going to give you the best outcome for somebody that has a frostbite injury. Now, this is where there's been some changes in just the basically the last couple of years. So the, the gold standard recommendation now on all the civilian guidelines is rapid rewarming at water that's 37 to 39 degrees centigrade. So that's essentially 99 degrees Fahrenheit to 102.2 degrees Fahrenheit. 
all the guidelines used to say go with 40 to 42, so, you know, 104 to 108 degrees. And you can still use that. The difference is, is that with the, nine, the 37 to 39, you actually get less pain with rewarming, and you really don't change the amount of time that needs rewarming. So if you still use the old standards, yeah, you're still going to get a good outcome. It's just going to be a lot more painful. And that's why all the, the civilian guidelines, Alaska guidelines, Lawrence Medical Society have gone to the lower numbers, uh, 37 to, to 39. Um, if I could uh, just jump in real quick. So even 37 to 39 or, you know, 104 to 108, that's really tight tolerances for what in practice is going to be a guy with a bucket of water over a fire. Um, what is, are there any dangers for being too high or too low? Yeah. So if you're, if you're too hot, you're likely to actually cause burn injury on top of the freezing injury, which definitely has a much worse outcome. Um, if you're a little bit cooler, you're going to have a little bit less of an ideal outcome. But the, the good news is you can actually get a pretty good idea of the temperature that you need without having a thermometer. So if you put your hand in the water for at least 30 seconds and it feels like a nice hot tub, you've got the right temperature. You know, so, so these temperatures are given as ideals. But if you put your hand in there for 30 seconds, you're like, yeah, that's the kind of hot tub I want to sit in for 30 to 45 minutes to an hour. You get a good temperature. If you put your hand in for 20 seconds, like, ah, yeah, that's a little too warm, then you're probably a little too high. So in the field, that's what you can use. Put it in. You're just aiming for an ideal hot tub temperature. You're like, yeah, that's really warm, but I could sit in that for a while. <laughs> now, the now the opposites of that are, so if we can't do the ideal, so we, we want the ideal gold standard, which is this rapid rewarming. So what are the other options well the other options are uh, we can just let the tissue rewarm on its own so rewarm slowly um, that's not as good as rapid rewarming but it's not terrible it's just nowhere near as good what's much worse is rewarming with a higher heat where you actually get a burn injury on top of the frostbite injury that's underneath. So our goal is rapid rewarming. If we can't do that, then slow standard rewarming in a warm room, put into somebody's armpit, body temperature, uh, rewarming, something like that. Least preferable is rapid rewarming. If you burn it, you have a terrible outcome. And then the worst of all possible cases is if you thaw it out and it refreezes. If you do that, they're going to have just a horrible outcome. And there ends up not being a whole lot of stuff that we can do with it. So a couple of questions that you got to think about if you got somebody with a frostbite injury is, are we going to rewarm them here? You know, we're going to do rapid rewarming with a bucket of water where we are, or do we try and get them out someplace where they can do it a little bit more controlled? And for the civilian guidelines, and this sort of makes sense for our military, for us in the military also is, they use a two-hour time frame, which is, can we get them to a place where they can do rapid rewarming in a couple of hours? So if they can do it within that amount of time, you're not going to have a huge amount of slow rewarming, and we'll get the best outcome with the, the rapid rewarming in warm water. If it's going to be more than two hours, which is honestly going to be pretty much any prolonged field care phase we have, then you may want to rewarm up right there where you are. But the risk you have to balance that again is once we rewarm them, we've got to make sure that they're not going to refreeze. If we rapidly rewarm them and they refreeze, they're going to have a horrible outcome. And once we rewarm them, is that going to affect what they can do? So if they've got a, a foot, for example, that's frostbitten, once we rewarm it, we really can't have them walk on it. We're going to need to carry them or put them on a vehicle or put them on a horse or something that's going to carry them out. So they're not really traumatizing that rewarmed area. So what do you do if you get somebody that's out in the middle of somewhere that you got to, that they have to walk out on it, then you don't want to rewarm them at that point. You get them to walk out to a point where they 
no longer need to use their feet. And then you look at rapidly rewarming them if they haven't already completely rewarmed. Um, if, you, if, you, if you don't mind. So, you know, wars like the Korean War, if somebody was frostbite, but he's out in the field, pretty much every evac from the Korean War was a prolonged field care type situation. They decide, okay, we can, we'll have to rewarm him here and then evac him by whatever route. <clears throat> How long until he can actually use the foot or the hand or whatever it is? Once you, you know, unless it's like very superficial distal, you know, like just the, the tips of the toes or something like that, it's going to be days to weeks before they can effectively use it. So once you get to that point of doing that rapid rewarming, you know, if it's a significant amount of the, the digits um, or the extremity that's involved, they're really not going to be able to use that for a long period of time. Okay. Um, and I imagine part another part of that evac plan, other than, you know, not using the appendage, is you're going to have to re-insulate compared to what whatever they were wearing was obviously not enough. So you're going to have to insulate that even more uh, during the yeah, evac. So, yeah, not only are you... Uh, so, yeah, once you've rewarmed it, you need to let it dry. And that's that's essentially just letting it air dry. Uh, we don't want to traumatize the area. We don't want to do a whole lot of heavy rubbing, anything like that. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have that edema, that swelling, those vesicles. So you're not going to be able to put back on you. If we're talking about the feet, you're not going to be able to utilize those same boots that they had. Mm -hmm. And you're really going to have to essentially splint and pad and protect those areas so they don't get trauma during the evac and they don't refreeze or none of those things happen. Okay. Now, I, uh, I mentioned, oh, how do you, you know, first thing when you're rewarming somebody, how do you know when you're, when you're done rewarming them? So put them in that, that warm hot tub until you have good, uh, good erythema and perfusion to the entire extremity. You know, so it's, so it looks sort of normal again. And that's going to be somewhere around 20 to 30 minutes for the most part in that warm water, you know, where that pale, cold appearance is going to go away. It's going to start to take back on sort of normal appearance and it'll be, it won't be hard or stiff. So typically 20 to 30 minutes, sometimes might have to go a little longer up to 45 minutes, but usually around half hour is going to be what you're going to need. Uh, I mentioned before the that there's a classification that gives you an idea of how bad the outcome is going to be or how good it's going to be. I guess depending on how you look at it, is uh, what's called the the Kachi classification system, or I may be pronouncing that wrong. Coach uh, Ray, C A U C H E Y classification system, which goes from one to five, but it's it's pretty simple. So a one is you only have an involvement of a distal phalanx. Two is you just have a middle phalanx involved or the proximal phalanx that's a thumb or great toe. Three is a proximal phalanx of any of the other digits. Then four, you're actually getting down to the metatarsals. And fifth is the, the carpals or tarsals. So what this basically tells you is if you've got a deep injury that's proximal, you're going to have a bad outcome and a high likelihood of losing uh, that digit. So that's when it's, it's warmed back up. We're looking for, is it superficial? You know, do we have clear vesicles uh, or do we have hemorrhagic vesicles? Now, the the edema of the frostbite, that's going to, once you warm up the extremity, that's going to come on fairly quickly. The vesicles may take a number of hours to form. So after your first rewarming, you may not really have a great idea for 6 to 12 hours afterwards once until you see uh, where those vesicles actually form. But if you've got hemorrhagic vesicles down at the proximal phalanx, you know, you know you've got at least a grade three, and that means you get a good chance of losing a lot of that tissue distal to that area. Now, in addition to the, the rapid rewarming, some of the other things that we want to do at the same time is we, we do want to give non-steroidals. Uh, that's been shown, or at least it's used in all the protocols to 
to decrease pain as well as decrease uh, tissue injury. Just like in burns, we're trying to modify the prostaglandin thromboxane effects. So Motrin is fine. You know, 400 milligrams twice a day. If you have Ketorolac, you want to use that. Fine, you can use that. But just want something oral. Uh, ibuprofen is what's used in most of the protocols. The one decision that we need to make for our evacuation is, is this an injury that would benefit from thrombolytics, and in particular, TPA? So before I talk about the, the pathophysiology, you know, a bunch of this we can have an effect on. Everything up until that uh, late ischemic phase, and really what that's talking about is using TPA. So TPA has benefit in reducing the loss of tissue within the first 24 hours of a rewarming of a significant frostbite. So how do you decide to use TPA? If you've got a class two or higher injury, so you're dealing with the middle phalanx of any of the, the fingers or toes or the proximal part of the thumb or great toe, that's somebody that could benefit from TPA. So part of our evac plan is, can we get them evac to someplace where they can get TPA within 24 hours? And even more ideal is within 12 hours. So that's more of a planning consideration, something that you would look at before going out. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Where can I, you know, where can I get them TPA if we're in a cold weather environment? This is even a consideration. Um, Ian, uh, on the pathophysiology side, when does the thrombosis happen? When it's freezing or during the re thawing process? So it, it starts during the, it actually starts during the freeze thaw phase, uh, which is really the second, second phase. So it, it starts uh, at that phase. And then it continues all the way up until it consolidates to that late ischemic phase. So that's why we said those first couple of phases are somewhat reversible with thrombolytics. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, it essentially starts, because you, you're starting to get some clot formation and so forth, even in those initial freeze phases. Okay. I was just thinking, I don't, I don't personally carry TPA with me. No. But um, it is very easy for me to carry aspirin with me. Um, and since we're talking about thromboxine inhibition, aspirin is an excellent, um, drug to do that. Um, so, yeah, so the, so as in most of the civilian protocols, aspirin is actually added to the non-steroidals. Uh, that's probably based on a couple of animal studies, but, uh, it may, it may be of some benefit. So. Certainly, throwing in some aspirin with your nonsteroidals while you're if you're actively rewarming somebody uh, is a good idea, and and there's enough support for that on the civilian side that I recommend doing it. Now, you, you do bring up an interesting question: is you know, is there utility to having TPA uh, out in the field if you're in a prolonged field care environment? And on the civilian side, this has been kind of debated back and forth. There's only been a couple of cases where it's been done and it's maybe had some benefit. But, you know, your risk is now you're giving somebody TPA that may have another injury. And are you going to make that worse? And can you handle the bleeding that they might have from TPA? So really for us, you know, for the most part, there's really not going to be a role of bringing TPA with you to give you in the field. I feel better now. <laughs> now, there, there actually is a, there's been some, some advances in, in frostbite. And there's actually a drug called Illiprost, which is a, a prostacycline derivative, which looks like it may have a significant benefit in reducing tissue loss, even up to 48 hours or 72 hours out from frostbite injury. The, and, and with the, the limited studies that they've done with it, they've had remarkable tissue salvage um, using this. Now, we got a couple big problems with it, which is that it's uh, it's not FDA approved and it's not available in the U.S. at all. Uh, but interestingly, some of our NATO partner forces may have it. And the issues with giving that in the field are are a lot less. They're more practical. You have to give it with an infusion pump. 
but other than that, the the risk of hemorrhage, et cetera, are just not. You don't have that like you have with uh, with TPA. So, in addition to your planning of working, I guess, like for TPA, the other thing you might be thinking about: Hey, do we have a partner force that might actually have this stuff somewhere that we can get somebody to? Because this might actually save tissue, certainly after forty eight hours, and maybe even up to seventy two hours after somebody's been rewarmed. Now, a couple of the the other things. So, if you if you decide you are going to rewarm somebody there in the field, what are you going to do? Well, first thing is you're going to take care of any other trauma, injuries, medical issues they have. Those are always treated first. We're gonna we're gonna treat the the frostbite last out of everything. We got to treat the trauma, everything else first. That still remains the priority. Uh, then you're gonna take off anything they have that's constricting, jewelry, any of that kind of stuff. We're going to rewarm them rapidly if we have that ability. Uh, if we don't have that ability, then what's going to be the next best? That's going to be the slower rewarming. And this is where you're thinking about putting their cold foot into your armpit and warming up with body temperature. You know, that's 97, 98 degrees, maybe, you know, usually a little colder uh, in those environments, but not a bad temperature and we know that that's second best to the rapid rewarming uh, we're going to give them the non-steroidals when they rewarm they're going to get a lot of pain so you need to do good pain control uh, that may be low dose ketamine that may be narcotics uh, certainly regional blocks could be really useful uh, for this because then you get prolonged uh, pain control now what do you do once those blisters uh, show up the vesicles so if they look like they're going to rupture, they're high risk of rupture, then if they're the clear vesicles, you can go ahead and aspirate them and, uh, and drain them out. If they're hemorrhagic, we really try and protect them and leave them alone because with frostbite, we know that that shows that the injury has actually gone down into the dermal plexus and we've got a much greater risk of deep tissue involvement, uh, infection, and so forth. Uh, antibiotics, there's no prophylactic role for antibiotics in frostbite treatment. But it's only if somebody develops an infection later on that you can use them. No prophylactic use for them whatsoever, so don't need to worry about that. And then what about debridement? You know, do we debride frostbite? Well, the answer is effectively no. Uh, frostbite ends up, even with deep tissue involvement, it really ends up being a dry gangrene, so usually you don't get infected with it, and we really want to let it fully demarcate itself. Um, before you start removing tissue. So really at least three to six weeks. And sometimes you can even go longer than that to let the tissue fully declare itself. It's dry gangrene. And essentially it's almost going to get to the point where it's going to fall off on its own or it can break off on its own. And what's actually really cool is if you have somebody with a frostbitten toe that's several months out and it's completely auto amputated, you can actually take that toe and you can send it to the sourdough saloon in Dawson City, Canada, where they have what's called a sour toe cocktail, where they've got a bucket of frostbitten toes that they'll put in a glass of whiskey and you do the shot of whiskey and you kiss the toe. So there's something you can do with your toe after you've lost it. Did you just make that up? <laughs> no, nope, it's actually true. That's probably going to be on the intro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually I, I have a friend that actually went and did that with his uh with his daughter. Yeah, it's the uh, sourdough saloon in Dawson City, Canada. Where you can do that. Oh, that's fantastic. Is that one another one of those a friend did it? Like <laughs> uh, I've got the pictures. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now if I ever go there I will do it, but uh but I, I this was not a personal friend this time. Right. We'll um, do a follow up. Definitely podcast. some things that we don't want to do. With uh, with frostbite, uh, certainly no nicotine, right? You got to get rid of your dip. Can't be smoking. We know nicotine's terrible for microvasculature, and it makes frostbite worse. Now, one thing that people sometimes ask, they're like, well, I can't rapidly rewarm it. Should I keep this frozen until I can get it to care as opposed to letting it slowly rewarm? No. The answer is no. Don't keep it frozen. If it's going to slowly rewarm on its own, just let it slowly rewarm on its own. And then the opposite of that is, of course, don't use an active heat source. Don't use a fire. Uh, don't use anything like that because then you will get 
the burn injury on top of the frostbite injury, and that's going to lead to significant tissue loss. And most importantly, have you guys ever heard of rubbing it with snow? Yep, I've heard of it, and I know it's not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I remember growing up in New England uh, when I was young and being told, oh, yeah, you know, get frostbite, rub it with snow. Well, yeah, it's, it's not a good idea. That uh, is actually an idea that came from Napoleon's retreat from Moscow in 1812. Yeah. I guarantee Napoleon, there are still the people surgeon, out there. The saw that, you know, they had a bunch of guys with frostbite, obviously, and he saw the guys that had these cold, frozen limbs. If they stopped and they rubbed them with snow, the outcome wasn't that bad, whereas the guys that went and sat up by the fire and warmed it up had horrible outcomes. So I said, hey, let's just rub it with snow. This will do great. And it makes sense, right? Because we're not burning it and giving a burn injury on top. Uh, but that myth persisted for 200 years, 250 years afterwards. So don't rub it with snow. We've come a long way since Napoleon's retreat from Moscow. I think it was the Russians that told them to do that, and they were laughing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, certainly that may have been true. <laughs> So I did want to back up, uh, back up to the assessment phase, because one thing I don't think, you know, we understand very well on the ground is if you have somebody whose feet are cold, they've lost feeling. I think we've all been in some situation, whether it's, you know, a cold basic training out at Sear school or, you know, just training up in the mountains, you get cold, you get insensate. At what point does somebody make that decision? Like, okay, this is beyond just a normal phenomenon and now i have to evac this guy whether it's in combat or in training because right there uh, not too far from your own backyard you have like the uh the air force seer school out there at what point do they pull somebody out of training and say all right you're done you're not moving on in your training and now this is an emergency yeah it's you know particularly uh, without looking at it a lot of that i think it's going to depend on the symptoms and how long they last, you know, so yeah, we're out in the cold, you know, we get, uh, your feet get numb. You don't really feel them. They feel cold. They get numb, but then you start exercising and you get that little bit of pain that comes back and you get the feeling that comes back and that kind of comes and goes and comes and goes. Yeah. If you've got, if you can't look at them, but you've got feet that have been cold for a couple hours um, or half a day, despite activity and moving around, then you need to take a look at those, you know, because normally with what we're doing, we're going to get some of the, you know, you're going to get the feeling coming back and then maybe you'll get a little cold again, but feeling coming back, you get prolonged periods of those prolonged periods of numbness with nothing coming back. Then that's going to be your first sign that, that you're at risk of things that you can't look at that they're developing frostbite. Okay, so that's kind of as the medic, you would ask your patient, you know, how long has it been since you had feeling? Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, if they get up, they start moving again. You know, they're like, oh, yeah, I haven't felt it since this morning. Probably need to look at that. Where it's like, oh, yeah, you know, it was numb. And then we were moving along and, it, you know, I felt it again. And now it's starting to go numb again. You know, that's that's more of that cold exposure and less likely. But it's for a prolonged period of time. Then you got to take a look at that. Okay. Is there any uh, visible, uh, I don't know, indications where EVAC might be necessary? Well, that's the, you know, that's the thing is they, they all look this pale white appearance. So it's going to be a combination of that appearance. Yeah. They feel cold and you take a look at it and you, you know, you put it in your armpit or someplace like that. And it turns, you know, it returns to sort of a normal color very quickly. Then that's just cold. It's a basic constriction. You do that for 10 minutes and it's still pale and yellow then that's some depth of frostbite so it's gonna be a combination of that history and taking a look at it how pale does it look and then if i just do a little bit of rewarming for a minute is that going to change it at all it's gonna be a combination of those things that are going to give you an idea of whether you need to think about the evac versus rapid rewarming okay that should be pretty helpful uh that's that's what I've got for frostbite. Uh, okay. Trench foot, unless you had other questions on that. Otherwise, I'll, I can move on to, to trench foot. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. 
Uh, so, so trench foot is pros to frostbite. So this is just prolonged exposure to above freezing temperatures. And it's really a combination of cool and moist, right? You really don't see non-freezing cold injuries that much if the feet stay dry. It's really cool temperatures with combined moisture. And we don't understand the pathophysiology of this that well, to be honest with you. We know it's a peripheral vasoneuropathy, and it's really kind of a combination of vasoconstriction leading to then some edema when it rewarms with some distal ischemia and some endothelial damage. But it really comes down to, we just lump it as, it's a peripheral vasoneuropathy that leads to nerve death and destruction. And the near to freezing temperatures that you're in with moisture, the quicker this will come on. This can happen at temperatures of 60, uh, even up to 60 degrees, but it takes a longer period of time, several days, if you're 60 degrees and wet. Whereas if you're, you know, 34 degrees, 35 degrees, in half a day a day, you can have these non-freezing cold injuries. And what you'll see with this is initially the limb is going to be cool and numb. But then once it rewarms, you're going to get kind of a mottled blue appearance, but it's still going to feel cold and numb until it hits what's called this hyperemic phase, which is going to be, uh, it comes on really suddenly, but it's usually a couple days after this uh, cool, numb, mottled phase where it's suddenly really hot, really erythematous. Uh, you've got slow cap refill, and there's a lot of pain associated with it. And that goes on for days to months. Now, the difference with non-freezing cold injury at trench foot is the treatment is completely different. We don't rapidly rewarm this in water. What we do with this is that we let it air dry in standard room temperatures. We let it slowly, passively rewarm. We don't rapidly rewarm it. Now, we do want to give pain control. Uh, for this, and we do want to make sure the person's hydrated, and once that pain starts, we may also need to use uh, some regional blocks. One of the other differences with trench foot is that it ends up being a little bit more of a macerated wet tissue, so it can lead to more of a wet gangrene. So you do have to keep a closer eye on this because you do have a more likely need to uh, debride tissue, and there is often some concomitant infection that develops with it. But again, the key difference is slow, dry rewarming with non-freezing cold injury or trench foot, as opposed to the rapid rewarming with frostbite. Now, what do you do if you get somebody that has a combination of frostbite and non-freezing cold injury? Then you go ahead and rapidly rewarm them for frostbite. And that covers everything that I wanted to cover on on frostbite and trench foot yeah that's great no yeah, that was really good no we appreciate it i'm sure there's going to be a lot of 10th group guys uh putting in requests for hot tubs after this episode right <laughs> <laughs> right we got to make some little foot uh little foot baths that uh, look like hot tubs right <laughs> um for the uh the uh, non-freezing cold weather injury you're talking about um you know infection is often goes with it is that because of bad nursing care and not cleaning the appendage no it's uh i mean obviously that would, have, that would be a factor but part it's some of the ideas of some of the pathophysiology of non-freezing cold injury is that in addition to the uh, the peripheral basal neuropathy that there also may be some concomitant uh, fungal and bacterial infection is part of it, and that's the part that's not really well delineated. Now, part of that maybe you really would think about it when you're getting these non-freezing cold injuries, right? So you've got uh, feet prominently that are immersed in water for long periods of time. You've got macerated tissue that's got openings that are just a nidus for infection. So you really set yourself up for infection for the conditions that lead to non-freezing cold injury anyway. So it's it's some combination of those, but not necessarily just the poor nursing care. It's just the it's just the non-freezing cold injury itself. Mm -hmm. 
the uh, I think the the Brits calculated that they had like seventy five thousand sepsis deaths in World War One from trench foot. Mm. And I think that really does just come down to the terrible conditions that they're in. Yeah. So for trench foot, you know, it's prevention. And what's that prevention? So this is, you know, this is where buddy checks are really important. But really, it's keeping your feet warm and dry, and dry in particular. Yeah, I remember doing a doing a SOCOM exercise in the winter uh, down at JRTC where we actually stopped after a couple of days and probably 10% of the people down there were on their way to developing um, immersion foot and non-freezing cold injuries mm. uh, just because they hadn't, you know, they hadn't changed socks or done foot care for several days. Yeah. So th- that's back to that simple prevention, right? You know, change your socks. Uh, if you use them, use thin sock liners to keep your feet dry with something on top of them. But, you know, Keep them dry, give chances to dry and warm up. Well, hey, thank you very much, Ian. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for thanks for having me on. For today's podcast, be sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast. Our boy is waiting there for you.